accustom myself to meeting endless parades of strangers everywhere in the world who tell me a desperate story with a happy ending. It's a very private story, you know, and they obviously trust me enough to, first of all, tell me what was wrong and then let me in on the fact that things have improved dramatically because they've developed a vision for their life and because they've decided to marry their girlfriend and because they've decided to have a family, finally, and to settle down and to work at their career even though they may just have a job and to tell the truth and that that's working and so they're very pleased about that and so you know maybe I don't know what the proper reaction to receiving information like that on a rather random basis is but But it's not nothing. We've met some of your fans, and uh, we got the impress impression they were all male fans, that the ones that we talked to, um, and that they were struggling with their manhood, and that you uh, give them this message that it's okay to be a man. It's not okay. It's necessary. What the hell are we going to do without men? You look around the city here, you see all these buildings go up, these men, they're doing impossible things. They're under the streets, working on the sewers, they're up on the power lines in the storms and the, and the rain. They're keeping this impossible infrastructure functioning, this thing that works in a miraculous manner. They work themselves to death, and often literally. And, and the... the um, the gratitude for that is sorely lacking, especially among the people who should be most grateful. You see university professors, especially of the social justice bent, who are among the most protected and privileged people that the world has ever produced. They take everything they have for granted, failing to understand entirely that there's a massive infrastructure of unbelievably hardworking, solidly laboring, working class men breaking themselves in half on a regular basis making sure that everything that always breaks works. And so a little gratitude for that is in order. And it's very useful to tell everyone, not just men, that they have an important role to play, a necessary role, and that if they act properly and honestly and forthrightly, that they can put their lives together and they can help their families and they can make their communities better and that that's not toxic masculinity, that appalling phrase. You know, but what I also don't understand, especially from the feminists, is that if the goddamn oppressive male patriarchy is such a hellish structure bent on the oppression and domination of everyone in the world, why in the world are women encouraged to flock into it and occupy all the positions of power. That makes no sense to me at all. If, like, is it supposed to be magically transformed in its oppressive nature merely because women happen to be doing exactly the same jobs that men were? Are the women magical in some sense and are going to decrease the degree to which the oppressiveness occurs? There's no evidence for that. You know that women who have male bosses are happier on average than women who have female bosses. The data the, the, the psychological data on that are quite clear. So there's no evidence that women run more compassionate and or efficient organizations than men. And I, and I don't know why you would expect them to because men and women are more the same than they are different, even though the differences aren't trivial. So, and the idea that there are no differences between men and women, which is the standard social constructionist line is only indicative of an ignorance of biology that's so profound that it should be criminal. So there's many, many differences between men and women and, and morphologically, physiologically, psychologically, temperamentally, um, hormonally, um, developmentally, right from, from, from in utero exposure to different sex hormones, 
And these are not trivial matters, and they have a, not a determining effect, but a crucial effect. And you see these especially manifested in the extremes, which is why, for example, that the rates of incarceration of men are 10 to 15 times those of women. That's not sociological. It's because there's a small proportion of men who are hyper-aggressive, and you can identify them when they're two. So, you know, the social constructionists, Judith Butler and people like that, they know absolutely nothing about biology, nothing. And their ignorance of biology is so profound that they don't even think that they need to know anything about biology because it's not real. It's all a social construct. And it's, 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 it does no one any good. We know in the Scandinavian countries, you know, here's a, here's a statistic. The freer the, the country, the fewer women in the STEM fields. Now explain that. It's easy. If you allow women their choice, they go into professions that care for people. If you allow men their choice, they go into professions that deal with things. And the freer the society, the more that happens. And so the Scandinavians are in this strange position where they've maximally freed their sexes by introducing socially egalitarian legislation. And one of the fundamental consequences is that the differences between men and women in Scandinavia are bigger than they are anywhere else in the world, both in terms of occupational choice and personality. And the Scandinavians have no, they have no idea what to do about that. It was a shock to everyone, including the psychologists who discovered it. But what are we going to do? We're we going to force little boys and little girls to be exactly the same? We're going to set up a huge bureaucracy to start to hyper-socialize them when they're, when they're tiny, so that they become identical in every way by the time they're adults? You really think that's going to work? You have to be arrogant beyond conception and cruel to think that such a policy would be either viable or, or reasonably implemented. The people who are successful are good mentors and they're hard workers and they're productive and they're competent and they do their job properly and they do everything they can. My observation has been that they do everything they can to find junior colleagues who have potential and possibility and work diligently to further their careers and find that a major, if not the major, source of satisfaction in their life. Certainly the people I've met in my life who've been very successful, and I've met many very successful people, are thrilled to death when they can find someone who's young and willing and able and conscientious and straightforward and diligent, and they open doors for them in every direction they can possibly manage. And none of that's credited to the oppressive capitalist patriarchal system, which also is doing miracles, is performing miraculously all around the world, raising the standard of living of poor people everywhere in the world at a rate that's unprecedented in human history. The UN itself, which I would hardly regard as a pro-capitalist organization, believes that absolute poverty will be eradicated by the year 2030 in its totality. It's been halved since between 2000 and 2012. We're, re we're moving rapidly towards a post-poverty world economy where no one is starving except for political reasons. And there's no gratitude for that either.